Hi, my name is Shireen Garib, and I'm the director of the Arabian Sites Film Festival and deputy director of the Washington DC International Film Festival. I would like to welcome you today to, the, to an interview with Nejwa Najjar, the director of Between Heaven and Earth. Nejwa is an important Palestinian and Arab filmmaker who's already left her mark in the cinema scene through her previous films, Pomegranates and Myrrh, and Eyes of the Thief, which was the Palestinian submission to the 2015 Oscars in the Best Foreign Film category. We're delighted to have Nejwa with us today. Were it not for COVID-19, we would be having a live exchange in a theater, but we hope this will give us more time to hear directly from Nejwa. We're also pleased to have with us Mohammed Mohammed, Executive Director of the Jerusalem Fund. The Jerusalem Fund has been one of our longtime supporters and we thank them for this. Hello, Nejwa, welcome. It's so nice to have you with us today. It's nice to be with you virtually, though it's heartbreaking not to be in DC with you. We feel exactly the same way, I know, thank you. There are several things that drew me to your film, but first I have to mention just how much I love the music and, and the, your selection of the various musicians. And I must admit, I went to uh, iTunes to try to find some of the songs after seeing your film. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you selected the music later on, but first, could you start by telling us your motivation and purpose behind making your film? Um, it started in a very funny place. We were in uh, Haifa, and uh, there were two places of falafel. And uh, there's Samia and there's Nahla, and they both talk about each other, but we decided to go to Nahla's. And I was taking pictures, and, and the, uh, the gentleman there who owns the place, he came up to me, he says, you know, what do you do? I told him I'm a filmmaker. He says, you know, my son is driving me crazy. He has a scholarship to go to Goldsmith in the UK and has refused to go. Asking him why, he said he's one of the guardians of Ikrit, feeling very ashamed of myself. I didn't know where Ikrit lied. So the following day, we went with the producer, who's also my partner, um, Hani Court. We had to go find Ikrit. We looked on Google Map. We couldn't find Google. We couldn't find it on Google Map. We went to a different app, which is called Ainekbe. So we found that it's one of the five villages that was destroyed by the Israeli army in 19, between 1948 and 1952. So we took this journey that took us 10 hours because wow. it had been completely removed from the map. When we finally reached around the area, it's about three kilometers away from the Lebanese border, there was the church steeple. So Hani said to me, I think it might be up there. So we found this tiny road. We went up the road and there came these young college age students, 20 years old, two men and a woman. And they came up there a little bit wary and we said, Ahlan, marhaba, we spoke in Arabic and they relaxed. And they told us the story of Ikrit which was a Christian village that uh, they won. They were the only village that in 1951 raised the court case to the Israeli court to return their, to their villages after they were asked to, to leave in 1948. They won the case in 1951. On Christmas day, they were told that they were allowed to go back to their village. They were dressed in their clothes, singing Christmas carols, they reached the village, they found the Israeli army standing there. They called them all up and they, at the signal of the Israeli commander, his hand, the village was completely destroyed except for the church. Mm. But since they raised the case court and they won the case, they were not allowed to be confiscated land, but they have to remain on that land. So generation after generation, and these young 20-year-old boys and girls were standing there with so much resilience that it gave me that sense of hope. And it also gave me that sense of, of sadness that we are really divorced from each other. Palestinians who live in the West Bank, who live in Jerusalem, who are the Palestinians in 48, even the Syrians in the Golan Heights, were so divorced from each other. So for me, the whole way back was like, how can I make this into a story which has the hope and the resilience of Ikrit? And it has the love which we need in order to continue our story. 
And that's how Between Heaven and Earth started, where we really are. We kind of are between heaven and earth. We're in that somewhere in that midway, midway zone, a story, a love story about divorce, a story about a country and a land, which I tried to make in this road movie, which exposes historic Palestine and takes us throughout that whole journey. So that's how it started. Long story. <laughs> I was actually going to ask the same thing because it was, and I, I have to tell you, uh, I mean, I was fascinated by this movie. It was something I truly enjoyed and I haven't been watching uh, films lately, uh, but it just, it was beautifully shot. Uh, I'd like to also echo what Mrs. Gharib said. The music was amazing. Uh, I liked how it touched on, on history and the, and the conflict there. And it was also a love story at the same time. There was parts of it that funny as well. Uh, so I feel like you, um, you really got you captured everything uh that you could Thank possibly you. do it was it was really great my wife loved it as well we watched it together um Thank you. but uh yeah it was it was an amazing film uh so so yeah i wanted to ask about where you got the idea but that answers it right there and um but we have but I can tell you a little bit more because we had a wonderful DOP. His name was Thomas Thomasen. He's from Iceland. This is an Icelandic um, uh, Luxembourgish Palestinian co-production. So Iceland gives uh, money to bring in crew. So we had five uh, main crew members that were, Palis that were Icelandic and we had 35 Palestinians and over half were women and not by intention, just by the way that it is. We have a lot of wonderful women and men that work in this field. So it's a lot of people that also we've been working on and building the industry with and have been working with with our past three movies. So, um, and it was um, a movie done in 24 days. We shot in, we started in the West Bank. We did Jericho, Taibat Ramallah and Ramallah. And then we went into historic Palestine where we shot in, um, Yaffa, Haifa. We went up way up, way up uh, north to Jish, the last point oh. before Lebanon. Oh my God! Uh, I can't believe you just said that because I'm fr and that's where I'm from. Ah, hello, <laughs> Yeah, originally I'm and, from Jish. Yeah. Uh, so you're good. And then we went to Ras uh, of course in Ikrit. We went to this lovely Palestinian town. It's the last Palestinian village on the Mediterranean, which is fighting very hard to keep its Palestinian hood. Um, uh, and we went to and we shot in Nazareth so we did all those locations in 24 days wow I so mean, the that's, movie that's, was yeah that's yeah. crazy uh, yeah so it was done it, with a lot of a love lot of i have to say a lot of love i mean people really pulled together on this production to make it happen uh i would want to ask you did you face uh, any difficulties filming uh, i would just i mean i would assume so uh yes. but in terms <laughs> In, from the Israelis, at least, um, was it was it hard? Did they present you with any challenges? Um, did they refuse to, you know, let you into certain places? Well, we had four people that were arrested on our um, crew. Uh, one was our production assistant. He was returning some props that we had, some guns that we used in the West Bank. And when he was crossing the checkpoint, he was stopped. And we had the letter, it was from a, um, it was from a prop house in, uh, in Yefta. We had the letter, it was props, it was everything else. He said, I'm sorry, this is loaded. We said, it's locked. You can't open it. It's, it's not there, it doesn't work. Um, but they took him in. Our production manager went to get him out. She was also arrested. Uh, our grip was from Nazareth. He went back home after a week of working. Some reason, we don't know why, he was also arrested. Our makeup girl, she, uh, she comes from uh, a family um, who suffered a little bit in the West Bank, suffered tremendously. Her brother was shot by a sniper, an Israeli sniper, but he didn't die. And they raised the case to the Israeli court and they lost, but they were forbidden to ever enter into Israel again. But she was quite determined <laughs> and she came back in. She said, I'll take the risk by myself. We... We, we, we tried to protect her as much as possible, but they were stopped by the police and she was picked up and sent back. She was arrested. She spent the night in prison and then she, had, she was sent back in the middle of the next night um, to Ramallah. 
um, there was one, uh, one location where we had to ask permission. In general, we didn't ask permission when we were shooting inside because we, were, we would be refused. And the only place we did ask permission was Ras Naora because our production manager insisted. We were sure we were not going to get the permission. So initially she said, oh, we got the permission, but we can only shoot on Monday at nine o'clock. We said, okay, fine. So we took that long trek. We woke up at five o'clock in the morning because it's quite a ways away. We arrived there and she said, I'm sorry, we're only allowed to shoot for one hour. We said, okay, fine, one hour, one hour. When we actually reached Ras and Naora, they said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to shoot. So we said, no. <laughs> we're gonna shoot so we didn't break any laws we the cameraman he took the camera apart he put it in his backpack we went a very small crew we shot whatever we needed to shoot we didn't obstruct anybody's way we did everything that we needed to do and we left so um, we did face we did face a lot of difficulties it was not an easy shoot I have to say it had to be shot fast. We weren't allowed to shoot, for example, outside the car in several places. We had to shoot on the fly. That's why I say it was made with a lot of love, really, because everybody pulled in with everybody. It was incredible, or else there was no way we could have gotten this movie made. No way. Well, it's, it, no sounds, way. it sounds like you and your crew were very persistent uh, because uh, <laughs> you got it done and, and, it, and it turned out beautifully. And speaking of the car, I also love the car because it reminds me of Lebanon. Uh, isn't it great? Uh, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it a great car? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that, was, that was a long search. <laughs> um, yeah. I just want to ask on this point, uh, uh, talking about the challenges of this film, can you compare, uh, was this film actually easier to make than your previous films or was it harder? S or similar challenges? How do you compare? It's a third feature film experience made me more confident. I was more confident. I mean, that makes things easier. And we, as a crew, we're used to each other. A lot of us have worked together um, once, two times, three times together. So there's a language which makes life really easier. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's also like, for example, there's not some of that nagging that sometimes come in, oh, the food, this, everybody's kind of used to everybody. Every <laughs> so that challenge of a crew getting to know each other was, was easier. Um, experience made a lot of things easier. The country is still very difficult. <laughs> There's still occupation. There's still uh, not, being, not being treated equally on any level, of course. We're under occupation. Story-wise, what I found was challenging was to write about the Arab-Jewish uh, dilemma. It was quite a discovery for me to find out about the abducted Jewish Arab children that um, in 1948, as you know, 750,000 Palestinians were forced to leave their homes and they were replaced by 600,000 Arab Jews brought in from the Arab world. Many who had been living very, very comfortably, especially like the Jews who were living in Iraq. These were very comfortable Jews that were living there and Yemen and Morocco. But what was a shocking thing to me was that there was a, it made me realize that the creation of Israel was very much a white colonialist state where any Arab, whether he's Christian, Muslim, or Jew, faces discrimination. And in this case, you had, according to Israeli statistics, of Arab Jews that now are trying to claim their, reclaim their children, up to 8,000 Arab Jewish children were kidnapped and given to Ashkenazi families to be raised with a white mentality. This was absolutely shocking for me to find out. But, and this figure, how do I work this into a story where it remains a fictional story and it remains our story. It remains a Palestinian narrative because also within the Palestinian narrative is the Arab narrative, be it Christian, Muslim, or Jew, because our narrative is a national one, it's not a political one. I mean, it's, we are, we're not anti-Jewish, we're not, we don't have a religious struggle. For me, it's not a religious struggle, it's a political national struggle, not 
excuse me, I made a mistake, not a religious struggle. So I, that for me was a really, um, it was an eye opener and it was a way to make a kind of a unity and an understanding of the region. And it was difficult to write it in a way where it comes out, you know, elegant as part of the story. So that was challenging um, to be able to create that environment. Um, we had to go to many environments where a lot of the um, Mizrahim Jews live uh, to speak to the older ones who are still speak Arabic, whose culture is still Arabic. And yet you have the younger ones because they live in a very racist society, which makes them hate their skin, are very violent and very angry. So that was, that was really an interesting and, and challenging part of, of the journey of the story and of the making of the movie. So yeah, so yeah. You know, the, I feel like that's an excellent point because um, uh, over around 10 years ago, I tried to go to visit Palestine because my, my grandparents left in, in 1948, they left to the Jish. They went to Lebanon and to, uh, to Syria. Uh, and I tried to go, and long story short, I was denied entry uh, into, uh, I, was, I flew into Tel Aviv and I was denied entry. But I, I do remember the very obvious uh, discrimination, uh, forget Palestinians, uh, the discrimination towards uh, Jews of different, uh, of you could say darker colors. Uh, basically, the, the ones with the darker skin colors uh, were at the lower end of the, um, the totem pole, so to speak. And the Ashkenazi ones were the ones that were uh, at the top of, uh, you know, the, the people interrogating me and, uh, and harassing me were basically the, the Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, and so I, I, that's very interesting. And I, that's what, one thing that I liked about the film as well is... Um, uh, the question of these, um, you know, disappeared uh, Arab Jewish uh, children. Uh, and I don't think many people, uh, even Palestinians, uh, know about this. So this is what, um, I think that's a very, uh, very great thing that you did with that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been hit, it's, it's been quite a big, uh, it only came out in the Israeli press, I think about five years ago. It's been quite a big uh, uh, secret to, to keep things very much quiet, you know, quiet it down. When they started, they started receiving their draft letters and how did we receive draft letters if the children are dead, if they're not there, you know, where are their graves? So all these issues came to, to mind, which, um, which I felt kind of fit into the sub story of, of our story. But, you know, our story is also a whole journey which Selma and Tamer took um, through, through, throughout the whole country. So, yeah. Um, As it, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so, no, I was just going to tell you in the, for the music, but go ahead. Oh, yes, I do. I don't want you to forget about the music, for sure. I'm not forgetting about it. <laughs> um, one of the sorry. notable aspects uh, were the characters uh, in your film that were Iraqi Jews. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, why you introduced um, specifically Iraqi Jews in the film? Um, I think because the Iraqi Jews from my research and um, from the people that I was, uh, I met and I read about, uh, a lot of them were the Iraqi Jews because they had lived well in Iraq, because they were actually quite integrated into the society, because many of them did not want to leave. I think that's kind of the tragedy of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, is that it uprooted a lot of people who were, you know, quite happily living in, in the Arab world and they created a religious conflict where, you know, we really have not had that. And since then it's only gotten worse and worse and it's com completely chaotic in terms of religious amnesties throughout the whole region and sex against sex, you know. You know, it did exist. I'm not saying that it didn't exist at all, but at least in the broad frame, Muslim, Christian and Jews in that last century had been living together. And mm -hmm. so for me, I think that, um, it was something that I was familiar with as part of the research that I had done. I, did, I wasn't that familiar with the Yemeni Jew, and I felt the Iraqi Jew is very close to us. I mean, in terms of Iraq, I understand that culture a little bit more. I know the music a bit more. So I was able to work in that part um, a little bit more. Uh, I have a lot of Iraqi friends who are able to fill me in with details. Um, so it just it was just a simpler more familiar 
thing for me to write about. I can say that it was just a more familiar. So that way, it was basically the Iraqi Jew I chose, as opposed to Moroccan or Yemeni or other um, Mizrahim. You know, so. And it was nice that you know one of the characters, one of the main characters, um, she was um, an Iraqi Jew, but she was listening to Arabic music on the radio, and so it was a nice way to make the connection that way. Yeah. But that's how it was. I mean. Um, I tried, and I actually went through with a very good friend of mine, Iraqi friend, you know, I was of that age range, you know, what kind of music would they have listened to? It would have been an Arabic song. I put an Iraqi song in the nightclub that was kind of like the Arabic culture being underground. Um, so I, 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 that's why the music played, the music literally, it was an, a nine month, I think, research, if not more, maybe a year wow. of just going through um, to find uh, something that uh, encapsulated the mood. And um, it's, it's not just choosing any song, it's actually trying to choose a song which reflected, for example, an era, reflected a certain time, which was true to the identity. For example, Dalida, when she sings in Nazareth at the parents' home, Baladi, yani, the, the desire to go to have that home to you know watani baladi to be in that home environment it's it's an important thing that connection that the people in nazareth in 48 the, the that they had to the arab world and yet being denied the arab world um so i tried to find things that fit it was also um, a very important part that in this movie as opposed to uh, eyes of a thief i was no arab actor no Arab crew could enter. There was no way I could have anybody who was from the Arab world. So I figured, <laughs> since we're not being allowed uh, to have the Arab world come to us, then I will bring it into the movie through the music. And that's another layer that I tried to create in the music of which I have Natasha Tlas, who is an Egyptian, uh, in, in Britain, Saad Masi, Algerian, Tanya Saleh, Lebanese. Um, I wanted people and I wanted women singers that were um, from Nazareth. Um, uh, so we had from, from Nazareth, we had from, uh, uh, from the Golan Heights. Uh, we had, so I, I tried to make a combination of the Arab world and from Palestine and to link that, that we are still part of the Arab world, that we are central to the Arab world. And that cause is central to the Arab world. And I, this for me remains as something that's kind of like a pivotal, it's, it's pivotal for me that the Arab world and Palestine are one entity. Uh, just to backtrack a little bit more about you, um, where are you originally from in Palestine? Where are you usually based and where are you currently based? Obviously with everything going on now. Uh, so could you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? I am, I think I'm, I can say I'm from probably greater Syria. The origins of my father is from Zahle, um, but he was born in Salt in Jordan, as was my grandfather. They lived in Jerusalem, and then my father was forced to leave in 1948. So he would actually be able, if he was alive, to get a, <laughs> to put a Palestinian ID because he was forced to leave in 48. My mother is from Yaffa, Yafawiyya. And um, she was also forced to leave in 48 as a quite a very young child. And um, uh, so I'm kind of, I'm, I, I feel like I'm from the whole area. I'm, I'm Palestinian and Jordanian and from the whole area, I feel this. I, my husband lives in Jerusalem. We got married, we lived in Jerusalem. So that's been my point since we got married. Um, uh, and with the lockdown, we got separated a bit because everybody got stuck in different countries, but that's, that's how it is. Did you always want to be a filmmaker? When did your interest start in filmmaking? Uh, good <laughs> question. <laughs> I did my undergraduate in political science and economics. And, um, I found I was studying at an American at an, I was in Cal, in California studying, and I had to search for professors 
my, my concentration was Middle East and Latin American. I had to search for professors that would give a sense of history and politics that was remotely, <laughs> remotely fair, remote, okay? And then I figured, as I grew up in a household where my father at one point was in his life was a journalist. Uh, we had always music and writings and books. Uh, there was always that kind of atmosphere in the house. And he taught me how to use a camera. I, was, uh, I, used to, I take photographs. I, I love photography. So when I came to do my master's, at the time, everybody thought my father was crazy to allow his daughter to go back to the US to study film. So it seemed to be the right combination of music, um, writing, uh, I love to write, and uh, to take pictures. So I did my, uh, my master's in cinema. And I have to really, literally, everybody was coming to my parents saying, you're letting your daughter go to the US to study cinema? But, um, so I think it was always inside of me, but it needed that courage from my parents, that push, just go do whatever you want to do, and that's what I, done since then so yeah <laughs> very lucky with that so yeah that's nice it is it's an unusual channel that you followed but usually those are the most successful and did you ever think you would have three successful uh well-renowned films by now <laughs> <laughs> no but i am i know that i am very persistent and i know that when i start something i have to finish it and then once that, and I mean, but I'm, but I'm also, I'm, I'm somebody who I, I don't do movies in order to achieve this, you know, to be, thankfully, alhamdulillah, you know, I do it because it's a journey for me. It's a discovery. I have been denied to know Palestine and to know the Arab world the way that I want to. So each movie that I did, it was really an exploration and an understanding. I'm trying to understand something. And I hope that I'm able to communicate that to, to audiences. And I'm hope, you know, I hope I'm, I'm able to create a, a world where there is that laughter and there's that love and, you know, there's that pain and the agony that we live. But, you know, ultimately I want our children when they watch these movies to say, you know, yes, this is the Palestine that I still want. And that this is the cause of what we're fighting for. It's not because we just want to fight. It's because you need a land and you need dignity and that understanding of the people. And I, had, I hadn't lived in Palestine until I got, until I got married. So, um, so it, it, was, it, it was a journey for me. I mean, each movie is a discovery of, whoa, so much that I had no idea about. So I think that's, um, so if that's successful, then I'm really happy about that, yeah. Well, your movie is brand new, so maybe it's premature for me to ask what's next. Do you have any plans for your next Another, film? Yeah, well, actually, we, I do. <laughs> uh, the quarantine, um, uh, the quarantine, because we opened at, at Cairo Film Festival, which was amazing. We had, thankfully, we had that. It's, it was like in the Opera House. We had 1,600 people. It was, you know, the people that I really look up to in our industry, Cairo is our Hollywood. Uh, it was our teachers, our, the people, the critics, um, that the industry, uh, the actors, the actresses that I would love to work with, they were all there. So to have a standing ovation for 10 minutes at Cairo, which is, of course, one of the top 14 festivals in the world, to have um, the press, to have that was beyond wonderful. But after that came COVID. So it's painful when you have a new movie and then everything stops and all the festivals that you've been accepted to, uh, you're, you're stuck with and at home with yeah. nothing. So what was the solution? It was to go back to an initial idea that I've been wanting to do for the past five years, which is a musical. Oh, and no. I've learned to do it. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> So it's, um, it's a musical which has, of course, a very strong Palestinian um, strand in it. And it takes place in Alexandria in the 1940s. Oh, nice. So it's, uh, yeah. And uh, so I sat, I had five months to write, rewrite, talk to actors, uh, talk to producers. And we're starting to get it off the ground now. 
and uh, so so yeah so we're doing a, yeah let's do it a time traveling musical I will say uh, that standing ovation was well deserved because that was an excellent uh, that truly was an excellent film and that's coming from somebody that doesn't really watch many films anyway uh, so <laughs> that was that was great uh, I really enjoyed it great I'm so happy to hear that well, to our viewers, some of our viewers might have already seen your film, others haven't. So those of you that haven't seen it, please, please, I, I hope you get a chance to see Nejwa's film. Nejwa, I'd like to thank you so very much. It's such a pleasure having you here. I hope next time with this wonderful film that you're describing, that's your next project, uh, we will have, it, have the film and have you live in Washington, DC. Thank you so much. And Mohammed, thank you so much for your time. It was a thank pleasure you, having no, thank, you. Thank you both. Thank you both. And actually, just a question: uh, Where can people watch this film? Uh, just go to your website, or how can they watch it? Oh, no, no, not yet. Now we're only doing um, festivals. Okay. And um, so now we have the DC Fest, uh, um, of uh -huh. course, uh, and we have then we have Boston. We'll be screening in Boston, Chicago. Chicago has a drive-in, which is really nice. Um, uh, so we'll be going to several festivals um, around the U.S. Um, it's, it's not available online in any way, shape, or form unless it's through a festival. And um, we'd like to keep it now just a little bit limited. Uh, if people want, uh, they want to watch it, if they can just watch our page, Between Heaven and Earth, either on um, WhatsApp, on, um, sorry, on Facebook or on Instagram. And the people who do watch it, you know what would be great? if they would go to IMBD, Between Heaven and Earth, rate the movie and review it. I mean, even if they don't like it, just review it, send, just so that I can get a feel of what people are, <laughs> what people are thinking. So I, I, if anybody wants to contact us on social media, on Instagram, we'd love to hear your comments and your thoughts because we couldn't be with you this time around. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you.